After the huge interest we got in our last video, which covered Roman legionaries preparing their meals, I figured we'd come back and take a closer look at some aspects of Roman cuisine, specifically the garum. But before we get started, I did want to give a huge shout out to Ancient History Magazine, which provided much of the insight for this video, as well as some of the artwork. And I had actually helped their Kickstarter back in the day when they first got launched, and I definitely support what they're doing. So anyways, let's get started. As the Roman Empire expanded, it created a great web of trade and commerce that crisscrossed the Mediterranean. This brought a whole new array of foods to the dining table. Among them was Rome's favorite new item, garum. A condiment so popular that it became one of the basic ingredients for many Roman dishes. Well, what was it? Garum at its most basic level was a fermented fish sauce used to flavor dishes. In fact, the ancient recipe book De Re Cucinaria often lists it as a necessary ingredient. It helped salt meals without drying them and could add a savory or umami flavor. Garum also had a particularly strong odor, though this could be countered with other ingredients. Today, you might be able to find similar sauces in the East, although it's kind of died down in the West. Uh, but in the East, you could find it in Vietnam, for instance, under the name Nuoc Mam, in Thailand under the name Nam Pla, or in Cambodia in a form similar to Tuk Tre. So let's now cover how it was made. The most common way was a fermentation process that took about a month. This first involved collecting the fish. And most commonly, they would use tuna, mackerel, sardines, or anchovies. Though other sea creatures might also be used, uh, so for instance prawn or oysters. These were then layered in a container. The first layer would be the fish. Normally they would just take the whole fish and plop it down in there, although if it was a particularly large fish, they might cut it up. So that's your first layer. You'll go ahead, put it at the bottom of this container, and spread it out. Then after this, you will probably add another layer, and this would include herbs, spices, and other ingredients to add some flavoring. Now the next layer is going to be the important one, and this is going to be a layer of salt that should be about two fingers thick. So then you would take these layers, the fish and the salt, and then the optional one which has the flavoring ingredients, and you would take these layers and you would repeat them again and again and again, layering them up until the top of the container until it was full. Now once you have this salt fish mixture ready, you then put it out in the sun and let it just stank up for about a week. And what's going to happen during this process is that the fish inside is going to begin to ferment into a liquid. And the salt there is actually going to be very key because it prevents putrefaction. And then once this is ready, after, as we said, a week, then what you're going to do is you're going to be slowly mixing it over the course of about 20 days or more, preferably. Now, once this was done and you have this kind of, you know, puree uh, of fish goop, what you would do is then strain it through a basket and collect it on the other side. So this goop that's coming up the other side is essentially going to be your fish sauce. And this is going to be your garum. And this is where you might again have the chance to introduce additional ingredients. Now, the stuff that didn't necessarily drain through, which would be perhaps a little bit more chunky, these solid leftovers would still be used in order to produce other types of fish sauce, which might be thicker and they might be more akin to a fish paste. Although that was kind of a separate condiment that the Romans would use. So this garum, as we've said, there's a lot of different steps in there where you can introduce different flavors. And some of these fish sauces would become highly recognized brands due to the quality of their ingredients. So you have, for instance, garum sauce yorum, which was one of the most famous and expensive ones. Uh, this one apparently was so expensive that hardly any other liquid commanded the same price apart from perhaps perfume. So that just goes to show how important this was or how high the demand was. You had other versions, mostly coming out of you know Spain, which were very popular. Uh, garum scombri, which used mackerel, roe, and actually blood in the mixture. And you have another version, the garum castimonarium, and this was actually a kosher version that guaranteed that eels, mollusks, and other similar animals were not used. So strictly the fish in this case, and it would have been popular among uh, you know Jewish communities. So while there's this kind of race to be the most expensive and the best sauces, uh, as this became more and more popular, there were also more brands that were more low tier that emerged such that the lower classes could afford them. And they obviously enjoyed these. Next, as we've stated, uh, this got more and more popular. So now we can talk a bit about the industry. So garum could actually be made on the individual level, either in someone's home or maybe even by you know servants. So this was particularly popular amongst the wealthy Romans who liked to have their country villas prepping garum and making it available at all times. But as I said, as the market expanded, it actually became a major industry with factories popping up across the empire. 
However, most of the major ones that popped up were actually located in areas which already had a long history of saltfish products. These included regions such as southern Spain, Libya, Sicily, coastal Italy, and some areas of Asia Minor. Now that these ramped up into production, you'd have tons of garum that would be mass-produced and shipped out to destinations across the Mediterranean. These were often bound for major Roman cities to feed the wealthy in their elaborate banquets. Merchants could also make a pretty good profit selling garum to the Roman army, which was otherwise stuck with rather utilitarian and bland foods. Ultimately though, as the Roman Empire began to decline, so too did the use of garum. Economic decline and instability of the 3rd century wreaked havoc on trade, which then crippled these major industrial centers. Though it would somewhat recover throughout the years, garum never really returned to the heights that it enjoyed during the 1st and 2nd centuries. Inevitably, cultural changes also led to the decline of garum and fish sauces in the West, though you can still find it. And then of course, as we stated, if you want to find your fish sauces, well, you can have a lot of those in the Eastern markets. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this look at this particular instance of Roman cuisine. There will be a lot more to dive into in the future, and I can't recommend highly enough that if this is a subject that interests you, definitely check out Ancient History Magazine. Like I said, I helped them with their initial Kickstarter a couple years back and definitely support what they're doing. This particular episode was based on their issue number 8, which has a ton of topics about food, drink, and dining across the ancient world, so definitely pick that one up specifically. So yeah, that's been it for this video. Hope you guys enjoyed. Stay tuned for more, and I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.